Look, it's the highest of high technology. It's the hardest of hard work. And without question, it's the most important thing in everyone's lives. I mean, in this business. I mean, what we accomplish every day, mm -hmm. we make it look easy. But the fact is, to get a molecule from West Africa to your burner tip, right. that's an incredible value chain. I it mean, is. and the yeah. people that have to work together to make that happen. Oil and gas makes modern life possible. The energy the world requires today and tomorrow will come from decisions made in the oil field today. Oil and gas will remain the leading source of fuel to power affordable energy that is sustainable for the billions of people that depend on the success of the industry. The oil field is a group of people, companies, technologies, and institutions working towards providing the world with safe, clean, storable, and transportable power. The Oil Field 360 podcast is a 360 degree deep dive into the leaders of the industry who will provide listeners with a first hand account of what it takes to build, maintain, and lead the energy business into the future. The Oil Field 360 podcast is brought to you by the following sponsors Locked in Global Energy and Marine, uncommonly independent. Lockton is the world's largest privately owned insurance broker and risk finance advisor. Lockton's global energy expertise is centered in Houston and represents the largest concentration of energy specialists, clients, and experiential knowledge in the upstream, midstream, and downstream segments of the oil and gas industry. Visit Lockton.com for more information. Upright Digital Upright Digital specializes in partnering with your business to maximize marketing efficiencies. We have a deep understanding of people, their needs, motivations, behaviors, as well as the technologies that enable brands in many industries to utilize what is available in a changing digital landscape. Find us online at uprightdigital.com. Welcome back to the Old Field 360 podcast. I'm David DeRode, one of the co-hosts this morning. I'm privileged to announce my uh, new addition to the uh, co-hosting panel, the infamous Jim Wickland. We're joined this morning by a uh, really uh, special guest, someone we've been working on getting in here for a while and a privilege to have him. But before we announce uh, our new guest, I want to uh, ask Jim... How is morning's going this morning, and, and welcome to the show, <laughs> David. Thank you. This is uh, this is my first podcast, so I'm I'm hoping I don't screw this up too badly. <laughs> uh, I'm doing great. Uh, I have been busier in retirement than I was before when I was working, uh, and and that's fun. My wife hasn't left me yet because I'm home all the time, uh, so everything's going good. It's nice to be in Houston for the week. Uh, now, if I could just get my hand fixed and and yeah. go shoot and go have fun again. <laughs> Uh, but so far, all I've been able to do is eat and drink, and I think I'm suffering from that this morning. We were talking about that earlier. I don't know why Kari felt like she had to mess with your trigger finger. She already shoots better than you. She and I. gets upset when I start beating her in sporting clays, and so she just decided this was the way to deal with it. Yeah. And if she hears this, I'm dead. <laughs> Good deal. Well, do you want to introduce our guest this morning? I uh, thank you. I would love to. Uh, I have known Jeff Miller for a very long time. Um, I, I have known all of his predecessors for the last 30 years as well. Um, having been an analyst for 30 years, my job was to evaluate companies, management, strategies, etc. And uh, I have to say that Halliburton has been one of my favorite companies in how it's been managed. And I think Jeff epitomizes the culture that Halliburton now has. And so I'm thrilled to have uh, Jeff, the CEO and chairman of Halliburton, at our podcast today. I am too. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you. Pleasure. Here. So, Jeff, tell us a little bit about yourself. I know a little bit about you, and and uh, I guess one of my big questions is, how does the uh, rodeo cowboy from McNeese State University become chairman, CEO, and president of Halliburton? Tell us a little bit about Well, yourself. I'll tell you what. It's a circuitous path. I'll have to tell you that. But it's um, – 
you know, I was really fortunate to get to do a lot of things and, and pursue passions. And one was rodeo. And I did have a rodeo scholarship at McNeese State. Um, and along that journey, I actually turned pro. So I rodeo in the PRCA till I was 25. But along the way, um, a professor at McNeese told me, he said, you know, a competent accountant can always find a job. And that's something you're going to really need yeah. one day. <laughs> and so... <laughs> With that advice, I went to uh, A&M to grad school and got an MBA and took enough accounting to be a CPA, and um, that was in 88, and so they were really snapping up investment bankers in 87 and 8, if you yeah. recall how I that do, went. And so I worked at Arthur Anderson, and so I spent eight years with Arthur Anderson, was a manager at Arthur Anderson, and one of my biggest customers was Halliburton. And you're doing audits at this time? Audits. Okay. Audits. Doing audit. Auditing consulting. Yeah. So I had a, it's an interesting story. So I had a chance to lead a team in Latin America. So I spent about a year in Latin America, six months in Colombia, six months in Venezuela, leading a team that was installing Halliburton's first desktop-based accounting system. So I knew nothing about computers. So my real job was to <laughs> supervise the team, about 10 consultants, and when they were finished, make sure that the books reconciled to what they were when they stopped, you know, when they started the install. But most of the time I spent sitting around drinking coffee with the Halliburton country managers. And this would have been in 93, 93 and into 94. And when I got back to Houston, I told my wife, I said, you know, that is probably the coolest thing I've ever seen. Uh, these guys, I, I think we want to try to do that. I don't know how, but that working overseas in those kind of markets yeah. selling services that's what i do now i think we would enjoy that and believe it or not so that was probably 93 by the end of 98 i am country manager in venezuela for halliburton jeez and uh, a pretty swift rise a swift rise yeah so i went from you know arthur i got an offer to go you know i've been turning down all offers i love the business of accounting i didn't care for accounting itself but i love the business yeah of accounting and in those days manager at arthur anderson kind of ran his own shop uh, but i had an opportunity to how was the engagement manager on halliburton in dallas and uh, had an opportunity to go to work for halliburton uh and sort of my stipulation is look i really don't want to be an accountant nothing wrong with it that's just not my passion um, but I do love the oil field, and I probably spent, you know, 90% of my time working with Halliburton. So I loved the people at Halliburton, liked all that they did. And I uh, had a chance to go, started out in financial reporting for a year, and that was in 97, I guess. And so in 98, I spent the year running the transition team for Dresser. We bought yeah. Dresser. Yeah. And then it, as that sort of wrapped up, we closed in, I guess, late 98, and I had opportunity to go to Venezuela as the head of shared services in those days, which was all things back office. Yeah. And so and I was in Venezuela for four years. And uh, about back half... When was, back in, when it was the best oil field market outside It was the fantastic, yeah. 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 And, um, you know, after a year or so in that shared services role, um, just things happened to work out for me, I guess. A lot of our people were sent to the field, and I was running shared services in Caracas, uh, about the time all of the IOCs moved to Caracas. And so they would call Halliburton, can someone come see me? I just took a notebook and started to go see them and read books at night about, you know, what is a rotating head and what does this tool do and all the rest. And next thing you know, I was in business development. So I became the really? head of business development and called on Petavesa and all the other accounts. I was the only native English speaker on the management team in Venezuela. So I literally didn't speak English for four years, uh, except at home with my family. Yeah. But what a fantastic opportunity to learn what we do and how we do it. And uh, studied at night and worked in the day. And you know, overseas, uh, you know, a business development manager includes getting up at four and getting on the cement truck to make sure that all yeah. of the equipment we said would be on location, on location. is on location. Yeah. So I was pretty hands on. That's important. Do you carry Do you carry some of that that uh, that experience with you today, running Halliburton? I promise Hollywood? you, the operating time I spent. So from Venezuela, BD manager, 
went to Angola as the VP for the our business there so head of operations there and then head of operations in Indonesia came back and ran Bayroid for four years so I really haven't done any finance since I got out of that but I'm telling you that's just the most important lessons in the world like today if we talk about Star Wars completions um, I've actually been in the shop when we were dressing tools and getting the brass balls out of them and all that kind of stuff so I mean I have a mental picture of how this works a mentor early in my career in venezuela said uh i can tell you want to do more at halliburton he said but you can't go very far at halliburton if you don't know how to cement wells i said well how do you learn to cement wells go downstairs and grab one of those engineers and tell them you want to learn how to cement wells and they'll teach you so i went downstairs and found the friendliest face i could see in the room and said okay Jorge Barone, your boss, told me that I need to learn how to cement wells. And so every day at lunch for like six months, I worked on the OptiSim tools and getting these jobs ready. And I actually cemented a job, the LeSable Wells for Exxon. I'm not sure Exxon would appreciate <laughs> that. And I was closely supervised, but rookie. I did actually <laughs> cement a well. So, <laughs> Well, I, I got sent overseas as soon as I possibly could when I was in the oil business. And, and I'd never been overseas. And one thing I learned is that one year overseas is worth about four years working in the States. No question. Because there is nothing to do but work 90% of the time. <laughs> so you got a very compressed education in, in your assignments overseas. I have, to, I have to believe that. Oh, I did. And it was uh, really 10 years. So Venezuela for four years, Angola for two, Indonesia for two, and then two more in uh, Dubai yeah. at the end. That's uh, well-seasoned fantastic opportunity yeah. wouldn't trade it for anything and i bet those relationships over the years still come into play um even today i, I know traveling in my my work and going overseas and it's amazing how small the oil field is and how interconnected it is and how somebody you met five years ago suddenly is somebody you're bumping into a hotel lobby somewhere and next thing we all kind of grew up it. together in this yeah. business it's interesting so i was had the opportunity to work on really every continent and got to know customers that you know some grew up in the business with me Arno Boriak was the deputy assistant manager in Angola when I was the country manager there and so he became the president of Total E&P about the same time I became president of Halliburton that that's just one example of all the people you get to meet Sure. in this business and at all levels you know i laugh i got a text from a customer that was on a rig in australia i guess about eight months ago i just got a text on my phone and he was looking for a basket he said i'm on this rig and i'm waiting on a basket i hate to go to the top of the company but can you help me get my basket sent here <laughs> i had to laugh you know of course i can eddie no problem let me call and get your basket you, you gotta know the right guy to call that's yeah. that's that's what that story is but it's just uh i just love the way all of that mixes together in this business i mean anyone that's worked in the field in this business this is such a team sport and collaborative game that if you like team sports and you like being with people we just accomplish the impossible but we do it in such a uh easy way i mean by that i mean i i laugh but you know just those relationships at all levels both inside of halliburton i've been there 25 years so i've had a chance to work with a lot of people and you know, i've had 15 bosses at halliburton if you can imagine that so that's oh, yeah. just how much moving around um but through that, you know, I've got A, I've got great confidence in Halliburton leadership and how we get things done systematically, but also just with customers. You know, they, you know, when it's all hands on deck, it's all hands on deck and everyone participates. I just like that about this business. Oh, yeah. It's definitely a get it done mentality. And the, the other thing I, I find so interesting about the business and the people around it, including the leadership, there's, there's a great deal of humility. Uh, sometimes most of the time and the time. and and it's also interesting how how everybody's there to help everybody i mean it's funny i love putting people together because i just love collecting people and you know you've got all the competitors they're all competitors in the room but they're they've all worked together or known each other and 
everybody can get get along and then and then they go back to <laughs> slitting each other's throats on the street but it's uh um i've always found that impressive and it's it's good to hear you say that because i think a lot of people um have different opinions on on the industry and and uh it's incredibly important it's a great place to be and, and still a great place to be and, and and we definitely need more people coming into it look it's the highest of high technology it's the hardest of hard work and without question it's the most important thing in everyone's lives i mean in this business i mean what we accomplish every day Mm-hmm. We make it look easy, but the fact is to get a molecule from West Africa to your burner tip, right. that's an incredible value chain. I it mean, is. and the is. people that have to work together to make that happen. Anyway, we do incredibly important work. We do it at the scientifically at the highest level from a safety standpoint. It's a really yeah. very safe place to work. And all of that gets done every day seamlessly, transparently to most people. Right. I worked in a number of different countries. I've been in Indonesia a lot. And, and every country is different. And then every country is the same. And, and while the cultures and languages may be different, in our industry, you know, there, there's a brotherhood. It's like being an Aggie. If you're in the oil <laughs> business, you're almost an honorary Aggie, whether you went to A&M or not. <laughs> True. Uh, the Hash House Harriers. Yeah. You run I've with run them the in Indonesia. Hash house. Yeah. Th- that's a hoot. And any place you go in the world... If you run into somebody in the oil business, you immediately have a friend. That always amazed me. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's fact. Right. There's like one degree of separation. Yes. And you were talking about it, David. If you haven't seen somebody in five years, it doesn't make any difference. No. You may as well have seen them last week. Yeah. Because everybody gets so used to that living and working internationally. Yeah. Yes. I, like I said, I would trade that time for anything uh, professionally, for my family. I wouldn't say it's easy. My wife... Ron, I've been married 35 years, says, you know, greatest thing we've ever done. Let's don't really do want again. don't really want to do it again. <laughs> yeah. Do it once and that's yeah. that's enough. No, I agree with that. Jim and I were talking earlier, um, you know, Halliburton is a is a story name and, and uh there's a lot of tradition and history there. But one of the things that, that Jim and I both were talking about is is kind of your focus on the future without losing sight of the past and, and the things that you're doing to carry the company forward. Um, you want to talk about some of that? Sure. Um, look, great beneficiary of an incredible legacy, which is Halliburton. And you know, one of the things that we wanted to do, uh, and we've been at this since probably 2014, was really capture what it is that makes us Halliburton. Um, And we embrace being Halliburton. We don't want to be anybody else. There are clearly going to be differences between the firms, and I celebrate that. That's good. Um, But it also was a lot of tribal knowledge over 100 years that got accumulated, and what we really wanted to do is establish who we are, what do we stand for, uh, how do we work, how do we behave. That's not a tactical strategy. That's a in emotional how do we present ourselves every day to the market and to each other and a lot of that's embodied in our value proposition which is i'm going to say it it's a lot it's a mouthful but i've said it a hundred thousand times i think but we collaborate and engineer solutions to maximize asset value for our customers and so everything we do is geared towards delivering on that value proposition um it's pretty succinct though even though it's a mouthful yeah it that, is that's a, that's a very direct idea of what everybody's goal is so i like that and i you know and i'll admit to you and and i guess everyone at this point i'm a real strategy nerd uh, i i really I read it live it love it study i'm a huge porter guy so michael porter uh read all his books even took some classes from him at harvard um and i just that uniqueness that is baked into strategic fit to me is sort of the holy grail and i think we've accomplished that at halliburton uh we don't have a corporate strategy in the traditional sense of a corporate strategy we have a business unit strategy which means we're really careful about what service lines we have in the business because they really need to fit into that collaborate and engineer solutions to maximize asset value for our customers and uh, so we get very distracted easily if we have things that fall outside of that. So we're really thoughtful about what's in there. And then from a, a value standpoint, 
uh, around that. You know, we celebrate collaboration. Uh, we've got five mainstay processes that are simple, but we're working on them all the time, every day. I've got them on my desk, so I don't ever forget what I'm working on today. So I'm either our business uh, business acquisition process. I won't go through the process. We've got five sort of key strategic themes that are all driving collaboration and engineering solutions. And everyone's caught up in those all the time. We talk about them all the time. And they're powerful. Um, and so when we measure ourselves, we measure ourselves back to service performance, service quality, you know, our control points. Did we fail somewhere? We go back to that to look and see what are we doing well. Um, but it's just been uh, a real journey. But as along that journey, service quality is fantastic. Um, so it's really continued to improve every year. Um, you know, with the customers where we're collaborative, it's an incredible experience, you know, but like a good, any good strategy, it's not for everyone, you know, but it does determine how we're going to show up and behave every day. And then from a value standpoint, really simple, just honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. Uh, and I say that, we talk about that a lot, uh, but honesty, not in the cash register sense of honesty, obviously cash register honesty, but more of that fundamental honesty with ourselves, with myself, with where we sit, where we are. Can we be honest? Because I think that's step one. That's the first step of any kind of progress. Sure. And then that open-mindedness is that, you know, others will have thoughts. Uh, let's, let's, let's get to the best answer. Let's be open-minded about all things. Uh, and then ultimately willingness, which is the willingness to go execute. And that's to me, that's the getting things done part of this, and so if we're you're not almost, getting you're things, almost Buddhist. <laughs> well, uh, we're, <laughs> to I, that, I really to thine, own, to thine own self be true. That's precisely yeah. the statement right yeah. there. Use that a lot, and and so we talk about that in our XCOM meetings. We talk about that with our employees. You know, problems are always going to be difficult. There's lots of challenges in our business, always will be. but nothing gets better until we really own where we are and what's our role and where we are. Maybe we don't have a role, but we still have to do something about it. You know, what you're describing is culture. Yes. And, and driven culture, not just passive culture. But the culture you've built or that has been built at Halliburton is impressive. But I look at several of the other large companies, and they have made a number of acquisitions over the years. And, and some companies have bought and traded different pieces. You guys haven't. You've been fairly insular. Um, that's got to help on the, the, the culture side. Uh, it, was that on purpose, or did you just decide that you had everything you needed and you were going to focus on that? Well, when I think about it, I think about, number one, um, everything's through a returns lens. You know that about me, Jim. So <laughs> if it's not going to make a return, we don't want to dabble in it. Amen, amen. And, um, and we do think about – I don't know that it's culture as much as it is strategy. If we acquire yes. a company – and they come in, um, we just begin the process of it. I find that honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness is valuable to everyone. And yes, generally, that's a, attractive uh, yeah. to yeah. work with people like that. And we're listening, but we're also – we're not mandating that you do X or do Y. It's more a matter of are you contributing to Halliburton and how, um, both financially and also uh, – professionally are you providing people to the company are you developing people those kinds of things so i don't find the culture clash that i'm not as i'm not particularly emotional that you're called halliburton you know summit's a very successful company at halliburton but man they embody those values in terms of how they run that business they're wildly successful we call them summit uh, they are summit but you know when we're in meetings with summit they're passionately honest they're passionately open-minded which makes uh, them Halliburton which makes them Halliburton yeah. and uh, and they also fit tightly into our value proposition for you know, our business unit value proposition that we apply to the corporation but they fit tightly into maximizing asset value for our customers they're highly collaborative they work as part of our sort of unique set of skills there now, there are lots of other things that we could look at but if they fall outside of that what we think is so important and makes us unique, then we're not sure that we're going to be successful with those things. Okay. And how much of, of all this do you bring? 
every CEO is different. Every CEO has his own imprint. When you leave Halliburton, you know, 35, 40 years from now, um, what's uh, you know, you're going to say, gosh, I'm proud because I accomplished. What, 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 what mark do you want to leave on Halliburton? Well, you know what, Jim? I don't ever even think about it that way. I just think about it one day at a time. But okay. I, I think that <clears> – <throat> and so I don't think really at all in terms of legacy. Um, I think more about what are we doing today. The people but, who don't think about legacies are usually the ones that leave the most impactful Well, it, it could come out that way. I, but I think that um, – yeah, we do all these things together. So I'm not, to, uh, while I own the strategy, really we collectively own that strategy at the XCOM and believe so firmly in that, that it's really easy to solve problems in the sense that we clearly have a North Star. We can clearly work together to get to that. Um, and so I, I would like to think that we remain all those things that make us Halliburton which I think we're highly compassionate as an organization to one another um you know Compassion I think it's not usually a word used to describe I think that's pretty good no but we're passionate about each other and we're passionate about our values and uh, and so that comes off as execution get yeah. her done all of those sorts of things you think about as probably as Halliburton but I think we achieve all of that because of the deep passion around execution in those things and, and the outcome is execution you know we think about the Halliburton guys we're really we never forget our roots I mean our, our business is safety and service quality that's what we sell and that's what we deliver uh, and obviously technology is a key enabler to all of that um, but first and foremost a service company you know I think uh, Curtis Muburn told me this story one time. It really made me feel good about Halliburton. But he was one of his very first wells in West Texas. I want to say it was in the early 70s. And he said there'd been a discovery and it, you know, flowing oil like they used to in the old days into the pits. And he said he was out there and in the morning the only other guy with him was the Halliburton guy. He had stayed all night on location helping him get that well stuff. He was a cementer. He had nothing to do with all that other stuff. But the Halliburton guy stayed. They ate breakfast the next morning. And he said, that to him is Halliburton. And I said, that's who we want to be. And so – Pretty impactful. We yeah. may be uh, – we, we talk about it a lot. I mean, you, you may be the smartest guy in the room, but there's no compunction to demonstrate that. I mean, our goal <laughs> is to make our – Clients more successful in long-term relationships, and I've never gotten that by being anything other than, you know, a servant leader or helpful. And so we spend a lot of time talking about our listen and, ro listen and respond mainstay process, but are we really listening? Are we really responding with valuable information? And we measure all that stuff. So it's just to sort of measure our own commitment to those values. Well, I can tell you is, you know, Concho was a client of mine for a number of years, and they were a big, important client to Halliburton, and they were pretty um, adamant about the crews that, that worked for them uh, out, in, out in Midland. And, and uh, you know, I, I talked with a number of the management team about, about Halliburton and everybody else, and similarly the, the, the passion that came across uh, the folks in the field and – commitment to doing things the right way was was a big deal and uh um anyhow that always kind of stuck with me um comments that uh that the company which a lot of those some of those guys are conoco phillips now but uh uh anyhow uh, i think um the people are what make the company i think a lot of these companies lose sight of that fact and 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 ultimately the people are what drive the financial performance and that return on capital that that everybody needs to be mindful of. But uh, seeing other companies out there, um, obviously you got to run a business. you got to run a business in, intelligently. But I think a lot of folks kind of put folks on the back burner, and that, that's ultimately what moves, uh, moves the needle forward. Well, well, finally, we've been through different phases of collaboration with our customers. And sometimes they'll collaborate for a year or two, and then oil prices will drop, and we'll go back to cheapest. But it's interesting to me that we're, the industry appears to be evolving into a more cooperative business than ever before. 
and I don't know if it's the you know the the, the old guys like me are dropping out. The average age of the geoscientists now is sixty eight, um, and and they're forced to. But it just strikes me that the collaboration we're seeing between service industries and oil companies, it seems to be more prevalent and lasting today than I've seen it in the last 20 or 30 or 40 years. Yeah, I see it less of a pricing exercise and more of a how we work together. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, we've got some highly collaborative environments where we work and the results are just stunning. Um, And we can collaborate on a couple of things. Anyway, this is more about how we show up. Yeah. And uh, pricing is always going to be a factor. It just is in this business. But we have to look past that and determine is our value proposition and our profit formula successful sort of at all pricing levels. And that discipline around process mapping, which is a big part of execution, I say pro- value stream mapping and those kinds of things, that generates value for us and our clients. We do that consistently. It's almost – you know, that's never a bad thing when you're reducing your costs. So no, whether right. the prices no. are high or the prices are low, we want to be consistently driving our continuous improvement exercises that are helping us and our clients. And I think that always matters. And so if you go into that with an open mind, every time we reduce capital, it might reduce revenues, but it reduces capital, improves returns. So I, you know, I just don't see that as a, ever a bad thing. I think it's interesting to me that we all talk about sustainability. It's if it's a new thing or a cleaner business like it's a new thing right in 2008 we had 1600 rigs drilling for natural gas <laughs> and all the associated trucks and everything else today i've got what 120 and i produce more gas yes, and that's a, that's a result of the industry being more efficient and so this whole idea that we've been a dirty industry and now we have to do something about it we've been doing something about it every day of our lives for the last 30 years and to me, the biggest point, and, and you make it, is continuing to get better at what we do. As you get more efficient, we become a cleaner industry. And and I, 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 it always gets me where we have to stop and change, and it's like, no, we have to keep doing what we're doing. And I think people misunderstand where we are as an industry in that. You know, if you go back and look at break-even costs over the last, let's just say, last 30 years, 40 years, for what we do, in spite of what commodity price does, because that sort of behaves based on a whole bunch of other things, the break-even cost for our business has consistently come down yeah. on the back of technology. And there have been some, you know, if you just go back and look at something simple like rig technology, if you go back to original sort of cable tool rigs and land rigs, and we got bigger rigs, better rigs, we produce more barrels, all of a sudden we get jack-up rigs, then semis and then just following that journey and mapping along at the same time the accumulative yep benefit proved impossible barrels in the world yeah uh, those just track right along and the break even continues to come down we we drill more we do faster and you know i guess i've never met anyone in this business that's not an environmentalist agree I mean, we are Agreed. outdoors people we love the outdoors um and you don't see wildfires where we have oil and gas production. We actually really care for the environment. Yeah, and I think that, you know, that's part of the reason for the podcast and trying to get more vocal. I think, you know, there's not – people aren't communicating enough, and I don't think people know enough about our industry to really appreciate and understand what you just said and that we are probably the biggest environmentalists. Most of us uh, enjoy being outside when we're – not having to be stuck in an office uh, or, or working outside and enjoy the outdoors and nobody wants to not have a good time on the water or a good day out in the field and um, yeah it, it kind of tied into the ESG topic um, around you know this whole idea of sustainability I think personally I think they got it wrong I think they should have put the G in front of it because without good governance and this appreciation for enterprise risk management continuous improvement you can't have great uh or good uh social outcomes or environmental stewardship and uh i feel in some ways you know a lot of folks um have mixed emotions about it as do i but in in some ways i'm hoping the industry will look at it as somewhat as a gift and what i mean by that is we have the opportunity, I think, to really tell the complete story 
um, and drive the narrative about what ESG really is. I think this industry, we've we've reported on production numbers, we've reported on financials, but we haven't told the full story very well. And I think there's an interesting opportunity right now, just given everything that's happening in the world, the fact that people have realized that low-cost energy is really kind of important and that energy is really kind of important when you think about global demand and increasing population and the modern life we've become accustomed to. What are your what are your, your thoughts on that? I mean, y'all are doing a lot of interesting things that I think are just representative of this uh, movement towards continuous improvement and efficiency, which has all the uh, the added benefits of environmental impact and everything else that goes along with that. Yeah, look, I think that yeah, I've already said oil and gas is just so important. Hydrocarbons, just energy density in terms of yeah, what they provide for what they are required to do um, is just too important. I, we see population growth of you know roughly 25% between now and 2050. So ignoring any improvement in quality of life, that alone is going to just demand a lot more energy than can be produced. And even under, in our view, under the Paris you know, requirements, it still requires a lot of oil and gas drilling and activity between now and 2050 just to meet the bare minimum. And I, when you start to plot these different scenarios, the gaps, the bookends are so far apart that that's um, just not Completely even. Completely unrealistic. It's unrealistic. Um, and so... Uh, it doesn't mean that a lot of effort won't go into uh, alternative energy. I don't question that, and sure. I, I, I welcome that. I do believe it needs to be at a fair playing field because as economies, we can't afford to subsidize all of that. I think that's detrimental to people. It creates uh, sort false of economies. A, a false economies and an artificial tax on the very people that can pay or at exactly. least cable to pay that tax, and we're seeing a lot of that today. Yeah. Um, but so there's no question there's going to be a lot of demand. Now, along the way, uh, we're always improving. So our emissions are reducing. They were reducing anyway, but they'll continue to reduce. As we right. put out more electric frack equipment, guess what? Emissions come down. At the same time, uh, our nutrition labels, we describe them as that, but how we keep up with our, the emissions footprint of what we do that becomes a criteria in R and D, and so everything will start to be not only, you know, I'll paraphrase, faster, cheaper, but also emitting less. Well, we know that when we bake that into R and D, those are the outcomes that we get right. pretty consistently. And, and to what Jim was saying, just the fact that we do it with half the equipment, we do it three, we drill three times faster right. than we did even say what seven, eight years seven, ago. Seven years ago, yeah. yeah. Um, this is breathtaking improvement, and it's a journey that we will stay on. I mean, I think fugitive uh, methane is something that you know gets managed better every year, and it soon. You know, and then the, the industry is committed to uh, reducing those those emissions. And so, what when I think about our business, uh, ESG is or, or is the, the the what the E part of that is well in flight. Right, okay, yeah. I would argue outperforming some of the other companies that are out there <laughs> that uh, you know are reporting how their emissions are going up. Some software companies and others, and yep. it's like no surprise. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I'm really encouraged with where the industry is headed. Now, uh, you know, when we look at the other industries. Uh, We've got, you know, Halliburton Labs is a look at those other industries, but it's not directing any capital to those other industries. I, I think that if they're real businesses, we'll find our way through there to see how to make money there also. Sure. Uh, One thing that struck me working internationally, and this is the the S part of, of ESG, and, and the societal part is the part that most people don't understand what it means in ESG, it means I should have a Twitter site or be on LinkedIn or something like that, and 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 that's fine. But I remember building schools and putting in water wells, and every place we worked, 
when we left, the community we left behind was much more modernized and much cleaner and a nicer place to live than before our crews came in and started working. Absolutely. And that has happened all over the world for decades, and nobody thinks about it. We do it on the in the U.S. on shore here, too, but we're already, you know, we're already a developed country. But you look at what the oil industry has done overseas just in the places we've worked, and that is amazing to me. Um, well, the unfortunate thing, I think a lot of people, there are a lot of people that don't really even get out of the city, let alone their state, uh, let alone other states in the U.S., let alone outside of the United States, and they, they I think they lack perspective about, uh, one, the impact, positive impact I think we, we've made on the world to make on the world, but also how good we have it here when you think about cost of energy, access to resources, et cetera. Uh, it's unfortunate. And, uh, you know, I think, I think traveling is, uh, as one of my mentors said, a well-traveled man is a well-educated man, and I, and I think there's a lot of a lot of truth in that. Only 28% of Americans have a passport, yeah. and half of those have only been to Mexico and Canada. So only 14% of the American people have been outside of North America. Wow. What a great education a number of politicians I could think would get <laughs> by visiting a couple of the places where you work. Yeah. Well, look, we're at Halliburton, we've got 140 nationalities that work for Halliburton. It's hard to imagine that. We work in about 70 countries, but we've got 140 nationalities represented in our workforce. And, you know, when we look around the world, uh, energy security is still really important in most of the world. And, <laughs> and this industry is very attractive in so many places in the world and we hire a lot of people all over the world we hire americans but we also hire everything else and uh you know it's always interesting when we have the debate around the workforce of the future but the reality is this is a great place to work and i think plenty of americans want to work in this business uh, but the rest of the world this is a super attractive business for a lot of the high, reasons high paying, high paying see the world secure the, yep. thing, the things that Jim referenced. I mean, we are viewed as we make a contribution everywhere yep. that we are. It's cleaner when we leave. It's safer when we leave. People are paid better when we leave. Mm -hmm. There's you know economic activity when we leave. We start service companies in about half these countries. Yep. So yep. Um, great things come from this industry, and I think that's well recognized in many parts of the world, and it's – becoming so clear now that you have to have that discussion that hey this is not a real thing i mean we're going to make progress but the human toll that you're seeing right now because right. Uh, we don't have energy security is devastating it is i gotta i gotta want, ask you one question i asked uh, robert eiffel this question the other day too do you have a sense of what your percentage of cajuns working for Halliburton are <laughs> <laughs> Can't have an oil field without Cajuns and Aggies. So we got a whole lot of Cajuns yeah, good, at Halliburton. Good. Now, I have to say that being from Mississippi, my state represents a large part of the workforce, especially in the offshore rig business, so don't leave us out. I wouldn't leave the guys from Mississippi out ever. No, but look, I went to school at McNeese. Yeah, yeah. My wife's from Lake Charles. Um, ran the Gulf of Mexico for a year. Um Great respect for the Gulf Coast. It's just what a jewel for the country, uh, for this industry, is offshore Gulf of Mexico. Sure. And all that comes with it. I was red fishing in southern Louisiana just about a week and a half ago. Yeah. You know, for, for, a, for a place that everybody up north thinks is, you know, just covered with, you know, terrible oil wells. It's, <laughs> uh, the idea that sportsman's paradise they don't quite understand, but it is. Yeah. And catching a 29-inch red, nine pounds, on a fly rod wow, was a lot of fun. I just have to throw that in. I appreciate <laughs> you throwing that in. I've never done that. Well, if you go red fishing with a fly rod, the guy will ask you, do you want to fly fish or catch fish? <laughs> so we don't catch as much with a fly rod as those guys throwing live shrimp. I got you. But when you do catch one, it's a lot of fun. Well, one of the things we, we always like to ask our guests uh, we have here is uh, we have a lot of listeners, diverse listeners. We're in over 120 countries, uh, our podcast, yeah, which is kind of neat. Um, 
we ask our, our, our guests if there's any advice they might want to impart on our listeners, any lessons learned or things they'd pass along to their younger selves or, or any, any advice they might want to provide to an up-and-comer up or, or, uh, or even somebody in the industry right now or, or even outside of the industry uh, from yeah, your perspective. I've had some great advice over the years and great mentors. Um, I'm very grateful for them. Yeah, advice I got from my grandfather that I think is still very applicable. Um, three things. Uh, first, you know, don't be afraid to take the jobs. In fact, do take the jobs others don't want. Uh, treat every job like it's going to be your last job or else it may be your last job. And then finally, always be learning. Always be learning from whatever the job is that you get. Smart man. That's great advice. And and I can just apply that in my own career. I mean, I have to say that you know I, I was not the first choice for Angola, but I was the first to say yes. That's no. <laughs> <laughs> I know it matters. Yeah, I know it matters. But I, for certainty, I wasn't the first guy on the list. But I was the first to say yes. Well, I finished that, and they said, "Well, now you're going to go do the same job again, but you're going to do it in Indonesia." My reaction was, come on, guys, I've already done that. Why would I ever do that? Um, it, let me tell you, I learned more working in Indonesia than I had collectively learned in my whole life up to that point. Really? I, oh, my gosh. That is the most diverse, complex marketplace in it the is, world. Still probably to this day between regulators, clients, national companies, everything is there. And anyway, I, I learned a ton and a lot of the strategy and stuff that we do today was born out of just snippets of experience and a lot of those snippets came from mm -hmm. working in Indonesia and and so it just goes to show that um, still got plenty to learn even though it looks like a job I've already had it maybe it isn't a job I've already yeah. had and so once I got an open mind and said hey I need to learn here it was powerful and then the other in terms of um, treat every job like it's your last i actually have had a lot of jobs over the years at halliburton but anybody that takes a job thinking well i'm punching my ticket and i'll move on they're probably going to get let go in that job that they're in i mean I, it felt like by the time i really understood it and became so passionate about accomplishing what we had was sort of when they said okay we're pulling you out of there but the idea that you're going everywhere we moved overseas or with halliburton we moved like eight times um yeah, we move in with the idea we're going to be there forever. Yep. Like, we're moving to Angola, make a life. We're here forever. And it may be two years, but if you go into that with the idea it's only going to be two years. You'd never learn the language. You will you never, never engage no. in the place. You won't make friends. You'll be miserable, right. and you'll probably get let go. And the last piece that I will not attribute to my grandfather, but I've heard it a lot of times, is don't quit five minutes before the miracle. And I, this is, you know, I like that. These jobs get long and they get hard at some point. I can promise you, there have been days where I went home and told Rhonda, "What are we doing?" But <laughs> you know what? Don't quit five minutes before the miracle. You don't know when that's going to happen. Right. And uh, that idea of sticking with it. I've been with, like I said, Halliburton twenty-five years, only twenty-five years at Halliburton, eight years at Arthur Anderson. I've only had two jobs, and really grateful that. Yeah, of course, I've had some managers that weren't that good. I learned what not to do from them. I've had some extraordinary managers that I learned a lot about what to do from. But, you know, out of 15 different bosses. Some good, some bad. Some good, on. some bad. And But that idea that do you really care about the company? Do you care about the mission? Do you care about where we're going? There have been just plenty of days where, you know, service some days is, is – I want to take care of the people around me, or I want to help. Today, I'm going to spend a day helping somebody that needs some help today. You know, and that, you know, that to me is just sort of what you do if you try to make people around you more successful. And over time, making other people more successful, more successful. helps. I agree with that. That's a great philosophy. I like that. Yeah. I always tell my people that work for me that you work your ass off till the very last second you're there. And so when you leave, you're missed, and everybody regrets the fact that you left. If you quit working a month before you leave, they'll be happy to see you gone. And that's in, in a small industry. 
reputation matters. Yeah, I hear you. There's a lot of truth in that. As I tell people, 20 years to build a reputation, two seconds to lose it. Yep. I also like this the other day I read, kind of to your point, don't quit five minutes before the miracle, is uh, be like a buffalo. And uh, buffalo, unlike cattle, when the storm's coming, they, they bed down. The buffalo, they kind of back before fences. They go and even with fences still, they they go through the storm because they get on the clean side of it a lot faster. So if it's not hard to do, I it's not worth doing. Buffalo. Yeah, there you go. But, uh, well, Jeff, we really appreciate you taking the time. We know you're a super busy guy, and it uh, means a lot to me and Jim, and appreciate all you're doing at Halliburton and doing for our industry and, and our country, quite frankly, because – Agreed. Halliburton's a big part of uh, of, uh, of our energy story. So, well, thank, thank you. you for being thank here. you for having me. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, Thanks, sir. Enjoy yeah. it. Thank you. Locked in global energy and marine, uncommonly independent. Locked in is the world's largest privately owned insurance broker and risk finance advisor. Locked in's global energy expertise is centered in Houston and represents the largest concentration of energy specialists, clients, and experiential knowledge in the upstream, midstream, and downstream segments of the oil and gas industry. Visit LockedIn.com for more information. Upright Digital. Upright Digital specializes in partnering with your business to maximize marketing efficiencies. We have a deep understanding of people, their needs, motivations, behaviors, as well as the technologies that enable brands in many industries to utilize what is available in a changing digital landscape. Find us online at uprightdigital.com.